Well, good morning, Walden Church, and it is Christmas season once again. It is the Advent season. Christmas is here, and so we are so excited to be able to bring you this Advent season, and it's probably going to start <laughs> like a lot of other Christmases have started in the past by the annual ritual of the taking down of the boxes, <laughs> right? Someone will probably ask you, or you will ask, hey, can you help us take down the boxes, <laughs> right? You're gonna put the decor in the same exact spot when you go Christmas shopping. You're gonna go to the same exact stores. You'll probably buy very similar gifts like you purchased last year for the same people, do the same traditions. You're gonna sing the same Christmas songs at church. You're gonna eat the same food for Christmas dinner. And then next year, we will do it all again, <laughs> right? Now, don't get me wrong, it's fun, it is. We look forward to it. Lots of people love Christmas, but there is kind of a bit of routine to it, right? There can be some expectedness, same monotony to it. Don't you hang the stockings in the same place every single year? You probably leave the hooks up all year long. Make the same Christmas dinner by using the same recipe, right? Don't want to default from that recipe. A few months back, I led us through a time of learning about joy. And I said I was tired of all the complaining, all the lazy, entitled, offended world. And I said, you know, coming here, coming, coming to church, that should bring you joy. I, I already get beat up by the outside world. I already feel like I don't measure up from the outside world. So when I come here, when I come to God's house, I want to find a place of joy. That first Christmas, that was anything but routine. And when Isaac Watts wrote the lyrics to Joy to the World, he tried to capture some of that day. He sang, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. That is what we are doing right here, right now, right? Weeks before Christmas, we are preparing him room. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. He's coming. That's what, that's what Advent means. Advent means arrival. We are waiting for the arrival. And if you knew that the Lord was coming, would you celebrate this Christmas the exact same way you celebrated it the year before? Or do you think you could find some new way to inject some, some passion into it? This past year, we also did a series on the universe. We talked about planets and stars. And uh, interestingly, in my research for that, I discovered that there is also a study, there's also a field of science that suggests that the universe was created by sound waves. That's interesting. It is, because I also believe the universe was created by sound waves. This is a scientific study called sonoluminescence. And I think it's ironic that without even trying to point to God, science sometimes does. One science journal says, the early universe rang with the sound of countless cosmic bells. The sound waves moved like ripples on the surface of a pond, and that is how the planets and stars were formed, and we can still hear the echoes of those sounds today. Another uh, German uh, physicist named Arnold Sommerfeld, he did a study, and he found that even in the smallest hydrogen atom, one hydrogen atom emits a hundred different frequencies. That's more than a grand piano. Grand piano emits 88. What if, what if the universe is not really about quarks and quasars or matter, antimatter, molecules, atoms? What if it's really all about a song? Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. This Christmas, we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Joy in your home, joy in mine, joy in 
this church joy in every church across the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let every heart prepare him room. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are still our joy and you are still our peace. And for as much as we all look forward to Christmas, you are no longer a baby in a manger. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we celebrate you as Lord this Christmas and always. Your name is still wonderful, counselor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And as your children, we cry out for a new day and a new awareness of who you are. We choose by faith to make the good news of great joy a reality in our own hearts so others can see the illumination in our life that all point to you this Christmas. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And we also know that peace on earth can only come when our hearts find that peace with you. Amen. So right now, uh, in this moment, we prepare him room. We prepare him room and we prepare for joy and we prepare for Christmas and we prepare for our King. We're going to read a passage from the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. It says, And when the time came for their purification, According to the law of Moses, they brought up him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Israel. This story from Jesus's life just takes place a few weeks after he's born. Joseph and Mary are headed to the temple and they're going to do what is required. Now, if this were a beautiful song, if this were a concert, the arrival of Jesus in the temple, that would be the equivalent of the conductor who walks out onto the stage. That's when you know that the song is about to start. The conductor walks out with black suit and tails. He waves to the audience and we all applaud because we know any minute now, the beautiful music will begin. But Mary and Joseph, as people who have been raised with this story their whole lives, they fully know Jesus may be the conductor. And from now on, the world will never be the same. But Jesus is not the first to walk out onto the stage. Just like we read in this story, there is history that is represented from Simeon and Anna See, long before the conductor walks out onto the stage, the first chair violinist walks out first, and it is her job to play the first note. And then everyone tunes their instrument. There is a get ready to Christmas. There is a get ready before the conductor walks out. There is preparation. And this preparation for generations has been the temple. 
the sacrifices, the prophets, and all the elements that make up this story today. And perhaps people uh, who were expecting this Christmas story felt that everything would just go according to plan, you know, by the book. And I bet even the temple system and the people that worked there were also kind of stuck in a rut of doing the same thing the same way every day. Tradition. But the joy of faith, the thrill of hope, by now seems so far away. And, and they were waiting. Everyone was waiting for this new and glorious morn. I mean, how many sacrifices do you think were offered in the temple day after day? And if you served in the temple, like Anna and Simeon do, I bet that service would become mundane. Temple work would have easily have become routine. And then seeing Mary and Joseph walk in at first glance, they would look like any other customer who was walking in the door. Plus, because Mary and Joseph are poor, they come with pigeons to sacrifice instead of a lamb. Actually, Mary and Joseph were offering a lamb. They just didn't fully recognize the symbolism of who Jesus was. So here comes a young married poor couple with their new baby and their two pigeons. But the song that starts in this moment would be anything but mundane. Now, Mary and Joseph, we are pretty familiar with, but who are Simeon and Anna? Simeon was a priest. The Bible says that he was seeking. He was longing for the Messiah to come. God's Spirit visited Simeon while he was going about his priestly duties, and he sensed, I need to go to the courtyard. So probably doesn't know what he's looking for. Simeon obeys, and he's meandering through the court, and he's being guided by God. And this poor man and his wife and their baby come into view. We don't know what Simeon was looking for, but Simeon obeys. Perhaps his vision of who a Messiah was would be this light of revelation, this glory for the people, right? Because all through Jewish history, we've seen great warriors and kings, people who were liberators, people who set people free. Simeon, perhaps in his mind, had these images of a strapping soldier or a hulking giant like Goliath or a military strategist or a general, and instead he finds a baby. And then we have Anna. She is a prophet, just like Simeon. And like Simeon, she is thrilled to see Jesus. Plus, though she never sees Jesus ever grow into a man, never sees the cross, she doesn't understand what the cross does, but she still has the ability to prophesy and say that she has seen the redemption of Israel. She says of a baby, right? Who looks like nothing. I mean, what would, what would a baby have to look like to you in order for you to say such beautiful words? Jesus is barely 40 days old. Simeon is an old man, Anna a prophet, two Hebrew people, both living under Roman occupation, meaning that every single day, their entire lives, they have watched their people live under tyranny, live under an enemy, day after day the same. Day after day, the people losing, Caesar winning. But now, the conductor is now walking out on stage. The time for tuning up instruments is over. It's time for the audience to listen. It's time for the music to start. So many wonderful things to notice about Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna are not just prophets. They are also two witnesses. You ever think about that? That they're a complementary pair? See, the law in those days was that in order for something to be believed as fact, for you to take it as evidence to court, it had to be witnessed by two people. And if you skip to the end of Luke's story, Jesus again is witnessed as a resurrected person by two people on the road to Emmaus. Anna and Simeon represent all of us the entire human race, male and female. Simeon is the male witness, and Anna the female witness, 
The man comes first, but it is not good for the man to be alone. So the woman comes second, joining in the work of the man. And together they complete the service to the Lord. Verse 36 says, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. Luke tells us Anna's name, her tribe's name, and her father's name. Why? Because even the meaning of each name is important. The name Anna reminds us of the famous Hannah in the Bible. Hannah presented her son Samuel in the temple before God, and now Mary is presenting Jesus in the temple before God. Anna's father, Phanuel, brings to mind the place where Jacob received his limp, Penuel. Like, like the limping of Je Jacob, this suggests a people who wrestle with God. More directly, however, the name Phanuel means face of God. And when Anna looks at Mary's child, she is looking at the face of God. So why does it matter that Anna is from the tribe of Asher? Asher is Leah's son. In Genesis 30, Leah says, Blessed am I, for women have called me blessed. Therefore, she named the child Asher, because Asher means blessed. What do you think? Would Leah's words resonate today with Mary's child? In fact, in Luke 1, Mary says, From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is might has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary sounds just like Leah. Because of her child from the Lord, she is blessed, and so she celebrates with joy. Simeon and Anna are not random encounters. It is a fortuitous meeting. It is divine. It is fulfilled. It is historical. It is epic. This is no ordinary day, and this would be no ordinary Christmas. Simeon and Anna were wise enough to see all these connections. Luke is wise enough to see all these connections. That's why he records them for you. So that when God moves, that, that God takes a big, huge flag and plants it right down in the middle of the story and waves it and says, something new is happening. Christmas, is that something new? Listen, last year, this last year, probably did not go the way you expected. And that's okay. Because Christmas reminds us that this timeline is not ours. Your life won't always go the way you expect. This Christmas, you're going to catch yourself saying, I wish this traffic would go quicker. I wish this line would go faster. And you'll be frustrated you're not in control. That's a good thing. What a nice Christmas reminder. Because you're right, you are, you are not in control. And best of all, you don't need to be in control. So you can relax. You can, you can give all the control over to God because he's got this. It's his timeline. You get to wake up each morning and you get to live in this world, this great life, and you get to witness this song. So take the opportunity. Pray. Say, God, thank you that you are in control. And that life moves at your timeline and not mine. What a wonderful Christmas moment where you can connect with God. At Christmas time, Jesus steps into human history and he turned everything around. Why? Because God loves you. And he wants to repair all the damage and fix all the pain. And he's exactly, listen, he's exactly the thing that we've all been waiting for. Christmas is a time to be on tiptoes and, and to be excited that you can't fall asleep. It's for getting butterflies in your stomach and for looking around each corner and for shaking each package, but not because Santa Claus is coming, but because this is the year that, that, that you get to experience with him. It's because the Lord has come. Let every heart prepare him room. Be filled with joy because you have a relationship with Jesus. Be filled with joy because there is a plan, because there is hope, because there is redemption, there is peace, and it's available for you right now. And all that patience has paid off. This Christmas, it's, it's your turn. 
like Simeon and Anna, you get to be a witness for Jesus. You get to hold the Christ child in your arms. You get to sing joy to the world. He's here. So, so the word I want to leave you with today is hinted at right there in verse 34 where Simeon praised God. It's the word uh, eulogia. It's where we get the, the word eulogy. And it means to bless or to celebrate or to praise. In short, Simeon worships God. Now, typically when we speak about worship in church, we're reminded of songs and of singing. And certainly that's how we began today's lesson. But worship is more than opening your mouth to sing. Singing the songs that we sing in church, just like singing Christmas songs, it can become routine. The same words appear on the screen. The band plays the same notes. We sang this song last year and the year before that. And the smile has left our face and the joy has left our heart. But see, the worship doesn't begin with lips and tongue, just like the concert doesn't start with the conductor. Something comes first. You know, in our story today, the prophets came first. Simeon and Anna come before the Messiah. And when it comes to worship, it starts with our heart. Joy to the world begins with, let every heart prepare him room. How do we do that? How do we prepare our hearts? The word prepare means to establish or to to apply, to fix in place. It conveys this idea of deliberate effort over time. The Hebrew word that gets translated often as prepare is sometimes also translated as fixed. Four times in the Old Testament, David uses the word fixed in the Old Testament. David used this word twice in Psalm 57, which is a psalm that he writes about the time that he was hiding in the cave. When Saul is the king and Saul is trying to kill him, David's men try to get David to kill Saul in the, in the cave. And then they say, you know, well, then the throne will be yours. It would be rightfully his. But David wouldn't do it. Why? I mean, Saul was trying to kill David. It would have been self-defense. Nobody would have blamed him. He could have gotten away with it and it would have saved years of frustration and pain in David's life. But David had already prepared his heart. David had already fixed his heart. And he said, I'm not going to take the kingdom by killing Saul. His own words about the instance say, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. See, if David had already not fixed his heart on what he would do and what he would not do, he would have succumbed to the pressure in that moment, succumbed to temptation. But he had already fixed his heart against taking Saul's life. So when we say, let every heart prepare him room, one of the keys to preparing our hearts is to fix our heart firmly like David. Our heart needs to be firmly in place with God in residence. And then worship flows from the heart. Worship is not just words and melody. Worship reveals the condition of your soul. Worship is, is word, yes, but those words talk about your soul, the condition of your soul. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that God puts eternity in our hearts. Paul says in Ephesians that we live for the praise of his glory. So you see, we are made for worship. We were made to worship. And I think some of the frustration that comes from Christmas and the season each year, that happens because of all the things that this season does, it fails to do the one thing that it should do. And that is lead us to worship. How much of the manger story centers around worship, <laughs> shepherds, angels, wise men, all worshiping. 
if Christmas is already starting and it's already feeling a little too routine, a little too familiar, perhaps it's because we have put the cart before the horse. The prophets come first. Preparation of the heart comes first. So that means worship comes first. So by beginning with worship, we can make a different Christmas possible. Worship and the Christmas season, they should go hand in hand. Christmas and worship should be about gathering together, and it should be about relationships, relationships with God and relationships with each other. Sometimes it's easy to worship. The Psalms are full of occasions where David is filled with glad tidings and he, it seems like his heart is just bursting. But at other times, the worship does not come as easily. It becomes a choice. And you worship based on the character of God, not on our feelings. And again, the Psalms. Psalms are full of occasions where David didn't feel like worshiping, but he chose to praise. He chose to live in that song each day. And so it's in times like that that worship takes on this new and deeper dimension. It's, it's times like that that worship enriches the soul. So Christmas should be a time when we are singing that our God is bigger than all of our troubles and that we refuse to allow our, our circumstances or our feelings dictate our love. When we worship in the midst of pain, that transforms life. You know, I started this off by saying that some scientists believe the universe began with sound. Well, the Jewish scriptures agree. <laughs> the universe was formed by a word. Those scribes often say that when God spoke, it was a song. This Christmas, let's join that cosmic choir. And now, all through the Advent season, let's sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let every heart Prepare him room. Let earth receive her king. Let's pray together. Lord, as we stand on the edge of the beginning of the Christmas season, before it starts, let us not forget that this is about worship, about you and about your son, about a baby in a manger. Let us model this season after the shepherds, the angels, and the wise men. To have humble hearts and to have a song on our lips. May each one here who is listening just begin to sing joy to the world all through this Christmas season. What a beautiful song, what a beautiful melody, and what beautiful words that express what all of us are thinking and feeling right now. Lord, our prayer is joy to the world. Not just for us, not just for Texas, not just for America. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let this be a season of receiving our King. Amen. We hope that you have a wonderful Christmas holiday. Of course, we will have uh, continued Advent lessons each week, but we would love it if you were here with us, experiencing Christmas together with the decorations and all the, the wonderfulness that fellowship brings. It's, it's one thing to watch this at home, but it's another thing to be with people, to shake hands, to hug and to hold and to share laughter. That is what church should be, and we want to be the church where you live. We have a Christmas concert coming up. We've got Christmas Eve services coming up that we want you to know about. There is no 
Christmas service on Christmas Day. I know Christmas falls on a Sunday, but we're going to be closed. We want you to spend time with your friends and your family, and we want you to have a Merry Christmas. We will see you next week. Bye.